r slash no sleep i teach at a home for the disabled in the bowels of delhi part one perhaps i would start this off by saying that this happens in new delhi which is the capital city of india the location doesn't really matter to my experience i never thought it had mattered but then i realized that there are certain glaring inconsistencies between delhi pronounced delhi by the way and the usa or most other western countries you come from that may cause you to think why the hell is this happening the police and bureaucracies are slow here to the point that they only arrive an hour after the crime even then a word from someone connected to politics would be enough to halt any police activity the streets are dark and nobody dares to go out after about eight and the beggars oh the beggars they're hidden away of course far from the tourist sites far from the stations that take white visitors to agra and the taj mahal but they're there children with no arms that look at you so plaintively that you knew if they had fingers they would be stretched longingly toward you children listening to australian accents complaining about delhi belly from eating too much lamb curry while they contemplate eating their own feces this is the city i've lived in all my life day one i've always had an affinity toward those rough and tumble street kids which was probably why i took the disabled home teaching job even though i'd graduated with honors in history from jnu and the job hadn't even asked for a basic school qualification only the request that the teacher would have to stay in the building I closed my eyes as I swallowed the overly sweet chai from the street vendor's glass, and looked into the myriad of winding city streets ahead, Rahul Tiwari was bloody ready to step into the adult's world. Excuse me, bye, could you direct me to? To? Er. Fuck being an adult, I'd already forgotten the name of the place, as I desperately addressed the street vendor. The home for disabled children. It's a. It's somewhere in this district, according to the address. New to Delhi? He snorted and I didn't bother to correct him. Better being thought new rather than utterly incompetent. You can walk from here. Straight on, two lefts and it's on that road. Small red building with a sign. Didn't know it was still there. Some scandal. Bless him with the ability to ward off diabetes from drinking his own chai, I thought gratefully as two lefts and a scramble through a dingy gate later, I was faced with a small, dilapidated red building with a crumbling sign. JN Home for the Disabled, it read. I was quite sure JN stood for Jawaharlal Nehru, our first Prime Minister, as did half the buildings in Delhi, but what I was more concerned about was the fact that neither the sign nor the job description had explained what sort of disability the children possessed. Physical? Mental? The long suppressed feeling of inadequacy began to bubble within me as I walked down to the shaded porch of the home. Rahul Tiwari, is it? A sable-skinned, tired-looking woman greeted me at the door shaking hands with me in a manner I usually associated with bossy lecturers. I'm Smita. What's your political affiliation? I support the op. This woman was hot, sure, but weird. Ah. Uh, Congress. I suppose. Useless, Smita grunted, opening the door for me. Oh. I replied, in a fit of verbose genius, before adding pathetically. You are the one who contacted me about the job, right? Well, I'd have to be. Smita shrugged, leading me into the place. The inside was also naked red brick, I'd have thought that was dangerous in a place with kids, but well furnished with benches along the walls. I'm the only person that works here, well, does proper administrative work anyway. I only started last month, and the other people here are Faisal the cook and I don't know the name of the cleaning lady but she's around too. We haven't gotten a teacher to stay for more than two days since I arrived, and the kids were kept amused by the cleaning lady and Faisal. The previous administrator left without a word, too. They vastly underestimate the degree of disability of the children. And, ah, uh, what's that? I hated sounding like such an idiot, but it was partly the Smita's fault for not mentioning anything in her contact letter nor job description. Are they physically disabled, or mentally disabled? Autistic? Don't you need a special certificate to deal with disabled children? 4,000 rupees a week, equivalent to 60 US dollars. No self-respecting childcare professional would take that. We're licensed, but the I'm certain it hasn't been renewed. Smita shrugged, looking amused yet also guilty at the same time. I haven't had much contact with the children, but I've got their name list here. Let's see. Three pairs of twins, all identical. Then two boys and one other girl. Nine children. Three pairs of identical twins? Excuse me, but why is the proportion of twins so high, is the disability due to congenital dash? A, hey, Mr. Rahul. Do you think my father owns this place? Smita raised her thick eyebrows and handed me the name list. I didn't enroll the children, they were all there before. The door to the right is where they are. 
The room next to them, the one without the door, is for storage of art materials. You'll get through a lot. You'll room in the teacher's quarters, ask Faisal to show you later. You can go into the children now. Apparently they're reading, the last time I checked on them. I hated that word, really. Read. Pradhan in Hindi, it called to mind the wet lips of an ancient chemistry teacher. God knows why I thought of it, but a sudden shiver of nausea ran through my body. I was poised to enter the room, my hand on the doorknob when Smita snorted from behind me. Good thing you're wearing pants. If you were wearing a dhoti they'd have had it off you in a second. Oh lord. Day 8. I've taught here for a week now, and I can say with some confidence that the children are unlike any I have seen before. My own high school had had a special education department, my university had children who were handicapped mentally or physically, but I have never seen children like these in a disabled institution. Timothy and Marco, 12-year-old twins, were both missing their legs from below mid-thigh, and they crawled on their hands and were prone to fits of violence where they would kick out their stumps and throw everything in reach. Zach, short for Zachariah, and Samuel were spacey six-year-old twins with dark skin and lithe, deft fingers, both of them missing their eyes. They were easy to tell apart, however, as Zach had a small hole in the side of his head where his ear had been removed. The girl twins were Janaki and Ranjana, both of them seemed to be mentally at the rate of a three-year-old although they were nine and had three fingers between them. The two non-twin boys, Eddie and Tinu, as he liked to be called, insistently scratching out the name on chalkboard, were inseparable although neither of them ever spoke a word, or even made a sound. The final girl, Alina, was 11 years old. A well-developed girl with an angelic face who had asthma and what seemed to be schizophrenia, often going into shrieking fits and pointing at walls that dissolved into an asthma attack. Eddie, could you come here? I beckoned ten-year-old Eddie over, perfunctorily checking over the other kids. The twins were watching the television I allowed them half an hour a day, and Tinu and Alina were playing a game of possibly the most silent scrabble I'd ever seen, sprawled by the door. As Eddie unwillingly left the television and came over to me, Three knocks sounded hollowly and cursing, silently, I may be new but I wasn't that stupid, I stood to open the door. A gusty breath of air and nothing else, except two more knocks. Frustrated, I shut the door and pretended to step on Alina's prone body as she played with the words, making her shriek in terror, then laugh as she saw it was only me. Eddie, do you want to play a game? I went back to Eddie who looked like Christmas have come early. As he and Tinu had far less developmental or physical disability than the others, they probably felt they didn't get much time from me. I thought of tackling his elective mutism today, and decided separating him from his also mute best friend may do the trick. Now, please remember that my degree was in history and not special education, hence my methods are really quite primitive. I held out a box of gems candy, and a box of Harry Potter cards with the characters' faces on them. The kid was bloody obsessed with the books, and it was all I could do to tear him away from them to do some proper work so it was no surprise that his face brightened even more. Who's this? I pointed at the face on the card. Who's this? Hermione. I tossed him a gem, and he tossed it into his mouth, grinning and pointing at Hermione. This? Who's this? I picked up the next card. This is Harry Potter. Eddie was laughing now, hysterical inhales and exhales and he caught the second gem. This? Okay I have no clue about this guy. I looked at the card and mercifully I was saved from lying, it was one of those small creatures with the big eyes I'd never paid attention to. Who's this, Eddie? He said nothing, only smiled expectantly and pointed at the gremlin. A harsh, sawing, grating sound came from the right, wet and sticky and echoing dully throughout the room. I presumed it was the same anomaly as earlier, the knocking which was probably on Smita's door, and refocused my attention on Eddie. Who's this? His smile faded off his face and his mouth opened slightly. His wheatish skin turned red with the effort and tears came into his eyes but I didn't relent. The song sound increased, but the students seemed immune to it. Who's this, Eddie? I'll give you the whole packet of gems if you tell me. I was almost begging the child, who kept exhaling harshly and ha, ha sounds but did not say a word, and the tears began slipping down his cheeks. Come on, you're a good boy. Come, I'll help you. The song sound subsided. Wetly. Hello. I put one of his fingers on my throat and the other on my lips. Say, hello, Mr. Rahul. See my tongue? He llo. Your turn, I'll help you. Say this and I'll teach you to say stupid Mr. Rahul. Hhhhh, he managed, and I lightly pulled apart his cheeks in a smile to say the next syllable. A. Now for the L, I smiled at his progress, and opened his mouth with my fingers to show him where to place his tongue. 
He didn't have one. I don't know why this struck me more than any of the other children. Half of them were physically disabled. But the sight of Eddie, trying valiantly to speak with no tongue set eyes into my chest and stomach, heavy and cloying. I looked again inside his mouth, at the dark chasm of his throat and the tiny, clean stump of his tongue. I looked over at Dinu, who was playing alone with the scrabble bricks and deduced he was the same too. Something. There was something about it all. I patted Eddie's hair and gave him the packet of gems, instructing him to share them with everyone. My face was coated in sweat. I had calmed down a little, and taken out the next sets of worksheets when Alina appeared at the doorway, looking at me balefully, tears streaking down her cheeks as I stood up to greet her. She was having another asthma attack. Day 12. Writing this in bed, most days I'm either too busy devising activities and marking papers or too damn tired. Pass the last four days as normally as possible with the kids, let them watch a bit of the latest kids film as a treat, and when they complained my stories were too boring I read them Narnia and several of the Jungle Book stories. I couldn't help thinking about my discovery, that the mute Eddie and Tina's tongues were cut out. How many of the other children possessed injuries I was unaware of. Strangely, I kept thinking of Alina's accusatory gaze on me as I helped her with the inhaler. Was she jealous of me playing with Eddie? What triggered the attack? if I'd removed all possible allergens from the room. Or perhaps I wasn't that selfless and devoted to the children. Under it all lies a throbbing, pulsing blanket of familiarity. To read. Iski Tabpadni I, the British chemistry teacher had spat in broken Hindi. It sounded like a Zaki Tabpadne Hay in his accent. Read this book now, it meant. Tears splattering on the book. I'd felt like Eddie, tongue cut out. Felt like Timothy and Marco, immobile. Spit in my ear. Read. Read this book now. Fuck, I gasped, not noticing in the sudden fragments of thoughts the fact that there was a little black snake on the floor, its hood reared and hissing. I grabbed my slipper from the other side of the bed and whacked it once right on the hood, and put on the other slipper, slapping it again and again. Let it be known that Rahul Tiwari is an expert at killing snakes, ladies. Day 22. Baba is angry, Zack whispered to me, one of the eyeless wins. Baba is angry so he pushed his fingers into my eyes. My eyes and Sammy's eyes. Your Baba? I murmured to him. Poor, poor abused child. Almost still a baby, hurt by his own father. Baba's room is dark and it whispers low the sound as of Jungle Book, Zack murmured, eerie in the sunshine that shone into his raw eye holes. Chill the kite, Mong the bat set free the night, Ka, Ka. He lapsed off into a stream of unintelligible words. I let him go join his brother in playing their odd form of patty cake, whilst I pondered the fact that parents would do things like this to children. A slight hoosha hoosha sound surrounded the room, possibly buzzing from the deli traffic and I idly watched the kids. I thought you were God, a slow whisper from the side of me. I slapped my ear as a reflex, startled and sweating, spit, spit in the ear from hot whispers, and turned quickly to see Alina standing there in a pink dress, her face blank. I'm not God, Aline. I drew out the nickname she liked us to call her. I'm just your teacher. How can I be God? Remember yesterday when I entered the class I dropped all the books I was carrying, would God do that? No. Alina considered, and smiled at the image before her face fell again into lines. But I hoped you were God. She paused, her eyes twitching. Can you hear the whispering? She looked at me, her lips upturned, her eyes unfocused, like a deranged fairy. But the crazy thing was, I could hear whispering. Day 28. Close to a month since I arrived here. The kids were quite alright today, albeit boisterous enough that I couldn't keep track of them all. Perhaps that was why I didn't notice Samuel stumble into the room crying louder than I had ever heard him. His hands were over his sightless eyes and he was screaming hysterically in the doorway. I ran over to him, quieting the other kids, and took him over to the next room, where they stored the art supplies. It was quieter here, save for a dripping. Samuel was still screaming relentlessly, his hands clasped over his right eye hole and when I took him on my lap I found he'd wet himself. Show me, Sammy, and I'll make it stop hurting, I coaxed, trying to remove his fingers from the death grip on his face. Come on, I'll show you. Baba. He screamed, kicking frantically at me. Was this hallucinatory? I finally managed to remove his hand and found that there was something wedged in his eye, the skin around it red and raw. I breathed shallowly as the boy's struggle slowed, understanding that I'd be helping him, and I looked closely at whatever was wedged into his eyes. Gingerly, I reached out to touch what looked like a putrid black mass, the smell was of something rotting like flesh in the bazaars and it felt rough, scaly. 
The sight made my heart thud in my chest, the boy with dark holes for eyes glaring up at me while I attempted to dislodge a fleshy object from the other socket, I felt like a tyrant. I finally pinched a bit of it, and bile in my throat, I began pulling it out. It dislodged with a soft, popping squelch and what looked like a long, black rope, peeling and crumbling in paces where sticky red could be seen. I fought the urge to vomit, and threw it on the floor, stroking Samuel's hair as he began to cry again, from the remaining pain and pressure I had managed to dislodge. I looked at the rope and recognized it as a decomposing snake, yet what was even more depraved was the fact that its head was caved in at the hood, it was clearly the one I had killed almost two weeks earlier. Vomit again forcing up my throat, I obsessively cleaned out the boy's face and eye sockets, not for fear of infections as I was sure no wounds were inflicted but for the sheer disgust I felt at it. The snake lay on the floor, shining. What would cause a six-year-old boy to do such a thing? Day 35 I didn't want to stay here, at this crumbling home for the disabled where the children were frightening and the adults absent. I longed for even the presence of domineering Smita, and took to spending lunch with her. She was very well versed in politics, and I could withstand her ranting and debating about the odd even policy in the city but at intervals it would shine in my head. The rotting snake. The hot whisper in my ear of my old chemistry teacher. Mr. Thornton, I suddenly recalled his name. The stump of Eddie's tongue. There was something at work here, all these children, I was beginning to think, were no accidents. Usually, I was under the impression that I annoyed Smita, or that my watery response of well, give it time didn't fuel her political spirit in warming up toward me. However, when she entered my bedroom one night in a state of high stress and moderate undress, her thick black hair tumbling down her shoulders like a goddess and her heavy eyebrows framing eyes that went deep within, I admit my first thoughts went to unsavory, lusty places. Ah, uh, yes? I made a show of yawning, making sure she caught the fact that I was only clad in pajama bottoms. She didn't even glance. Come down, with your shirt on, for God's sake. I found the girl, Alina vomiting in the bathroom. Smita gabbled, and I felt a slight sense of relief. I had felt a sudden seize in my heart and I had presumed one of the bizarre, eerie events had occurred again, but thankfully it was just a sick kid. I put on my shirt and followed Smita down the hall. You should knock when you come in, I could have been doing highly unsatisfactory things, I grinned at Smita who rolled her eyes, her hand twitching as if she was going to hit me. We were going down the rickety stairs, so she didn't risk it. I entered the girls' bathroom after her, gingerly, in Indian schools, if you're caught in a girls' toilet it's twenty strokes of that reed cane, mind you, and winced at the heavy scent of vomit everywhere. Alina was standing in the middle of the floor, pale and shaking, and the old woman in a sari I presumed was the cleaner was prodding her stomach which was distended with gas. The cleaner turned around, ignored me, as most Indian women tend to do anyway, even old ones, and nodded slowly at Smita. What? I asked Smita as her eyes widened. What is it? The girl's pregnant. My hands started shaking slightly, none of the boys had reached puberty, not even the twelve-year-old twins. My heart in my throat, I looked at Alina, aware even in this fog of shock that she would be the most shocked. I made my way over to her and clasped her to me, but in no way was it sexual, in no way could I see anybody touching this girl enough to ruin her in this manner. Haram, she whispered to me. In this case, her oh. God was right on the mark. I'll write more later. Right now, my fingers are still shivering, and I can still hear it all. And Mr. Thornton. Smita and I have decided to research more, she's just as new as I am and has also noticed weird happenings, as prepossessing as she seems. We're going to the university library nearby tomorrow, to research about this school, perhaps some history could help us. Or perhaps what the chai seller had said over a month ago, that there was some scandal. I don't know what this is. Ghost stories do not happen in India, we have enough heartbreak as it is, this fatherless nation. But I don't know what else this could be, this thing that whispers in classrooms and leaves 11 year olds pregnant. What it could be that reduces me to fragments of memory, of Mr. Thornton, of the piss splattering down my 11 year old legs, of hands that polished glasses. Of kids who shouldn't be disabled in this violent manner, but are. But I know it isn't gentle. I teach at a home for the disabled in the bowels of Delhi. Part 2, Final. I need to come clean. This was not a diary that I'd been keeping about my days in the home for kids. And it's not the ramblings of idealistic young Rahul with an optimism for the world that rivaled even Gandhi's. No, this is a confession, written by hand in a pokey room guarded by a corpulent police officer. And you may have even heard of me in the papers, maybe you'd seen my dark eyes and shadowed cheeks and thought oh, he's so young. Oh he's too young to be so bad. 
Yes, you're right. Young. They were also damn young, reader, they were just children. But where you think you're right, stops there. Day 36. No way in hell one of those boys impregnated her, is there? Smita asked bossily, checking names off a list she'd written in her impeccable handwriting. Aren't some of them twelve? They're legless, Smita. I rolled my eyes. And Alina isn't exactly the type of girl that would sit there and let boys crawl over her like that. Other than what's probably mild schizophrenia, there really isn't anything wrong with her. She'd have notified us if one of the boys were bullying her. God, Rahul, let me tell you that there's something wrong with this place. Smita inhaled sharply. I'm lodging a complaint with the Delhi CM, and, oh hell. I told you, this place is depraved, look at that snake. Calm down, I said dryly, kicking the snake out of the open door. Then I remembered that it had been in the process of crawling out anyway, from inside the house. I shuddered, and turned to Smita. Shall we go dig our fingers into records now? It wasn't as easy as we'd expected. I've mentioned that half the buildings in Delhi had some version of Jawaharlal Nehru in their names. Man, I love the Prime Minister but couldn't he have stopped half the fucking buildings in the country being named after him? I almost wished it was named after some unknown idiot, so that I didn't have to breathe in book fumes much longer. But as usual, it was Smita that used her big rack and bossy voice to get us what we came for, hefting the books in her arms whilst scolding the librarian rhythmically, like a pulse. Here, useless Rahul, you search this. I'll look through the founding of the school. Smita suggested, pushing half the books onto my side of the dusty library table. Hey, it was only founded in 1980, that's quite new, judging by the crumbling state of the building. I thought it was founded in what, 1850? Seeing as Nehru wasn't even born then, I'd think that your assumption is way off the mark, SMI. See, I knew a history degree would come in useful. Once. Plus, she seemed to like me shortening her name. There's nothing here except long descriptions of opening day, I groaned to Smita, running my hands through my hair. Apparently it was opened by an old fellow named Baba Ram. One of those yogis. Yes, he's mentioned here too. Smita looked thoughtful. I've always assumed it was him I was corresponding. Baba Ram. That's what the letters are signed, instructing me to admit in this kid or that, instructing me to get a teacher who was inexperienced. What about the scandal though? I recalled the throwaway words by the tea seller that first day. Some scandal. There was something, even I can remember it now, a couple of months ago. Oh, I remember that. Smita rolled her eyes. Akshay Jain, the old school teacher. Apparently he's inside on tax fraud. Some scandal, I've read better news about the damn president. Can't you go five minutes without talking about politics, SMI? Date 37. Something. Something off about the yogi who owns the place. I don't know why, in the picture he looked ordinary, those archetypal sadhus that run schools and preach the benefits of twisting yourselves into pretzels. Might sound pretty exotic for you but here in India these people are everywhere. But there is something I notice about him, he looked almost snake-like, slit pupils, a flat nose. That's not what frightens me though. What frightens me is that in his eyes there's something very, very familiar. Day 40. Don't want to come inside. Rahul sir. One of the twin girls with limited mental capacity, Janaki, was standing outside the door, her thumb in her mouth. Tina's scaring me. Clap hand in my ear. He say sssssssss, like. Baby girl, I soothed her, my hand cautiously on her shoulder. If Tini comes and scares you, you tell him that you're not scared. Then he'll shut up and bother other people, right? He's scary, Rahul sir, Janaki murmured. Is Tinu the scariest thing in the world? I changed my tactics, smiling at her. Tiny Tinu with his gap tooth is scary? Tiny Tinu, Janaki laughed, clapping her hands. No. No scary. Exactly. I straightened, satisfied by my obviously superior skills with children. Next time Tinu scares you, you call him Tiny Tinu. Now, are you scared of anything, Supergirl? Snake, she whispered, and my hand on her shoulder shuddered along with her. Day 43. God, Rahul. Smita was panting, sweat standing out on her forehead. She looked a sight to behold, my heart almost hurt, perhaps I have come to truly like this earnest, over-political bossy woman? And slammed her hand down on my desk, spilling my coffee. Okay, I take that back, I don't love her. Baba Ram? She snapped, not even noticing the way the coffee was seeping into the newly printed worksheets. I just called up the district council, 
the man has no address, and has not paid any bills, home insurance, any bloody thing for three months. All the money in his account has been directed to the home trust, and nothing else. Smita, what's happening in this home is something insane, and I'm quite sure depraved, I sighed, using my handkerchief to mop up the coffee. Please, forgive me if I don't care about the financial doings of an old yogi. He probably went and drowned himself in the Ganga River. Oh, no, no bodies were found in the past two months. Smita shrugged, and smiled sheepishly when I glared at her. Hey, not my fault I read the newspaper, bye. Bye equals brother. The fucking friend zone would never leave me, would it? Anyway, Smita continued, sighing. I just find something funny about him, Rahul. I checked the records, for the past two years, the place was taking in only ordinary disabled kids, but after the Jane fellow was indicted for tax fraud, the proportion of twins rose by 300%. Something fishy, there's a very odd smell around, and of course you, being a man, can't smell it. I did smell it. I smelled something very familiar, but I didn't tell her. Day 50. He touches me, Zach confided, sweat on his lip. He didn't say who, and I was certain he meant his father. Does he beat you? I asked him. There was a nerve twitching next to his sightless eye holes. You don't have to tell me, Zach, your papa is gone. Nobody will hurt you here. I looked around the classroom and fought back the urge to hold each one of these kids, but it's not enough. They were all playing quietly, Alina looking worried with her hand on her almost blossoming belly, tear tracks down her face. I did not know what to say, reader, these kids are beautiful, otherworldly creatures but there is an air of victimhood to them all. Not a victim of their birth, but a victim of cruelty. I stroked Zach's curly hair away from his eyes, I noticed one of the twins had gone out, but was too preoccupied to notice which. A low shuddering noise came from the walls, adding to the mood in the room. I can show you, if you want, Zack murmured, his eyes downcast. His voice almost a whisper, he stared at the walls. How he does it? Show me. I gritted my teeth, awaiting a slap on the face or a kick to my shin. I knew it would be good for him, and he was just a child, he couldn't hurt me. Show me how. His hand went out, and he grabbed my crotch, squeezing it. My breathing went faster and faster my eyes blurring, but the boy in front of me was frightened. My head full of cotton, I stroked his hair again, and smiled, letting him go sit with his twin. I couldn't breathe, oh lord, that hand on my crotch, I couldn't breathe and I wanted to die. Dirty whispers in my ear, my hands shaking, I was 12 again. I was 12 in chemistry class and Mr. Thornton was bent over me, the only boy with perfect English. I couldn't breathe. I rushed out of the room, slamming the door and leaning my head on the wall, quiet murmurs echoing from within the classroom. Oh, let me just tell you. I was 12 years old, the best student in chemistry, a topper in mathematics. Mr. Thornton's favorite student in the British-run missionary school. And he touched me. Again and again. He touched me and he topped me in every class, highest marks in the grade. He topped me in every way. I remember he would tell me to read, in his terrible Hindi, Padan, Padan, homework de cow, but the class was empty and under the desk my pants were down on the floor. Read, read, show me your homework, his lips on my thighs, his seat in my throat. My bottom had hurt, I was disgusting, I was broken day in and day out till I moved town. I never topped in science again. I willfully fucked up my experiments, I tore up my math homework, I kicked my SSLC physics paper across the room, getting me a big, fat zero. I hated it. I hated science, I hated myself. So you will understand, won't you, reader, why I bolted. Why I was sitting there between my classroom and the art room, trying more than anything not to cry. Why all this felt heartbreakingly familiar. Why I could not abandon even one of these children. The ghost of the hand on my groin felt hot and intrusive, brought to life by Zach's reenactment. Sir, you okay? One of the legless twins, Timothy, was crawling from the art room, his eyes hollow. There was a small wet spot on the shorts he wore. You okay, sir? Yes, I stood up, still shaking, and hefted him into my arms. I just felt that I should sit down on the floor, my bum needs a bit of dust daily. Day 54 Rahul G, Alina addressed me for the first time in close to 20 days, using the Hindi honorific for sir. I let her, if it was what made her comfortable. Do you think all punishment is deserved? If someone does a bad thing, Aline, then should be punished. My mind was still somewhat on the other day, and I wanted to kill whoever it was that submitted Alina to such torture that a child would have to bear a child. 
No matter what, sir, but if they didn't mean to, she looked otherworldly, a beautiful, fair girl with hair fluffing down her shoulders like candy floss. If they didn't mean to, and they say sorry dash. Sweetheart, I wanted to reassure her that her abuser would be punished, and I stretched my hand to her shoulder, but let it hang in midair. Whoever does something like that, they will be punished. Both by man and by God, so help me. Yes. Alina looked up at me, her light eyes full of tears. Allah have mercy on him. Day 56. Writing this in bed. There is thumping on my wall. A slow, methodic series of thuds, and then whispering. A whole crowd of whispering. Perhaps I may believe in ghosts, because no human can sound like 50 people whispering at once. Somehow, the idea that it is a ghost, it's easier to believe that the fact that there could be something else at play. But there is something else at play along with the supernatural here, something disgustingly human. And frighteningly, I think I'm beginning to figure it out. Day 60. This is not a date, you imbecile. Smita ordered two hot coffees, snapping her fingers at the waiter to make it quick. We were in the Indian coffee house, waiters dressed like colonial servants, the perfect time machine. You don't go and think this is something like that, understand? How can I date you, SMI? I wheedled, stealing a biscuit from her plate. You're already married to every politician on the planet. One of these days I'll become a minister, and the first thing I'll do is make sure idiots like you don't get jobs, Smita threatened, but she was smiling. Now tell me, what's worrying you? If we can make a conclusion, I'll submit and refer to the police today itself. All right, I sighed. Alina, what's her full name, SMI? Hassan, I think. Smita frowned. Not too sure about the spelling, but it's a variation of Hassan. So there's no doubt she's Muslim, right? I continued. Even the other day, she was talking to me, she mentioned Allah. What does her religion have to do with it? Smita asked, so absorbed she even forgot to scold the waiter for dripping coffee all over the table. She's pregnant, and I'm sure this is no Virgin Mary miracle. So what role does religion play? She's definitely Muslim, and she's religious, I sighed, my hands shivering. But remember what she said that day we found she was pregnant? She said hair ram. I didn't notice at the time, but now. I exhaled harshly. God, Smita paled, her quick memory remembering the scene. That means. Additionally, I gabbled, if I couldn't get it out now, I would never be able to. Additionally, last month I was talking to the blind twins, Zach. Both of them claim their Baba abused them. Rahul, Smita twisted the rings on her fingers around nervously. Rahul, their father died in the army ten or so years ago. He was on the border. They were brought up by their mother, who died, and they were left on the street, where? Where Baba Ram found them, I sighed, rubbing my forehead. I stayed silent, because I didn't want to say it. Perhaps it's selfish of me, but I let Smita say it. Bastard, she spat. Bloody bastard. He abused them, then he ran off. That Akshay Jain, jailed under tax fraud, I bet he was in on it too. Fucking cunts. They abused the kids, and they fucking ran off. Fuck. I'm filing a report. I'm going to do it now, damn the stash. In her anger, she noticed my face, on which perhaps something had shown. Are you alright, Rahul? Her hand closed softly on mine, and the coffee was ice cold. Day 63. It still does not add up. It doesn't fucking add up. Baba Ram must have ran off, what, two, three months ago. And Jane arrested around that time too. But. Then what the hell is happening here now? I'm sitting in bed, sleepless, all nights are now sleepless for Smita and I sometimes she comes up here, and rests her head on my shoulder, and we revel together in our inability to sleep. In our incompetence in not knowing where this damn sham of a yogi was, our inability to realize. My eyes began to close, and I probably dozed off. I woke because the wall seemed to be burning. The wall my bed was pushed against. The one I was afraid was haunted or whatever, was hot to the touch. Smita was leaning against it, asleep, her sable cheek turning a shade of red, and I shook her awake. Startled, she clapped her hand to her cheek and looked around in alarm. Fire! She screamed. There's a fire. We've got to get the kids out. You do it, I instructed her, throwing on my shirt and a pair of slippers. No, listen, you go to the kids' dormitories, wake them, wake the cook, both of you get the kids out. Fire departments always take a long time, I'll go look at the source. I think it's only a gas leak anyway. Only the wall's hot to the touch, 
I ran down the steps, watching as Smita sprinted down the other corridors. I smelled no smoke, and I went down into the kitchen, which was dark and silent. Nothing. I checked outside to see if there was anything in the next house, nothing either, nor was there anything on the first floor. As I approached the classroom where I usually teach, I heard a soft, lost sobbing, muffled by the usual hundred whispers. I stepped into the class and turned on the lights to see if any of the children were there, but the room stood stark and garish. The whispering only grew louder as did the crying, and exhausted, I leaned over, grabbing the wall for balance. It was burning hot. What the fuck? I ran into the next room, the art room, but even that was cluttered yet devoid of human presence, and I felt my pulse race as the fucking crying and whispering grew loud. The heat from the walls radiated into the room, and I was sweating, I swore I could hear the slow crackling of flames. Heart thudding, I stepped backward from the room, and stood in the corridor. I looked at the doors. Spaced about six feet apart. Oh God, I whispered. My hair drenched in sweat from the increasing heat, I ran into my classroom and began banging on the wall, no matter my fingers were beginning to blister from the heat. It was a hollow, wooden sort of thudding and God knows what strength possessed me to allow me to lift the heavy teacher's desk and swing it, but I did. And in that space between two rooms, in that space between two walls lay a tragedy. Alina, her hair untied, her eyes livid red from crying and her belly swelling, stood in front of a fire that burned up, 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 into the ceiling above. The hissing was louder and I spotted in the corner of the room a bed of snakes, writing and trembling over each other, panicking to get away from the flames, rushing out through the hole I made in the wall. In the corner there was a small crawl space that I was horrifyingly sure led to the art room, in which snakes writhed hysterically. And next to Alina, almost concealed by the smoke, stood a bent, half-naked old man clothed only in a saffron loincloth. He was around 70 years old, although his hair was dyed black and tendrils trailed down his shoulders, his beard straggly and graying. He looked at me as though I was no threat, and I realized that this was the monster. This was the ghost in the walls, the impregnator of children, and the mutilator of them. The fire raged, and Alina stared into it, as if in a trance. Alina. I called, and Baba Ram merely smiled, and I decided to lie. Alina, come quickly, I've called the police. You think she will come with you? Baba Ram spat, laughing at me from behind the smoke. These are all my children though you think they're yours. I gave them a life from the streets. I gave them the gift of innocence, by blinding them, by hitting them on the head, by removing their limbs. Fuck your innocence, I spat at him, moving closer to the fire so I could get at him. Fuck your everything. You frightened them with your damn snakes, you tried to frighten Smita and I. You mutilated them so you could abuse them, you hurt them so you could satisfy your own damn, purr. This one, the elderly man only smiled, his yellow teeth protruding. This Alina, however, I didn't touch. She is beautiful. And she will now. Undertake. Punishment by fire for her sin. Agnipot. She will walk the path of fire to show penance for her sin. For your sin, I frothed, and lunged at the man. He fell backward, as frail and breakable as a feather, but still he smiled. Do you think I had not been watching, Rahul sir, watching what fears you the most? He grinned from under the choke hold. His hand trembled on my navel before traveling down, down into Mr. Thornton's touch and his hot whisper. He unzipped my pants as Alina stared at the flame, my weak, idiotic hands trembling and faltering away from his throat. My chest felt heavy, my nether regions being massaged by dry hands, oh lord, anyone else would have fought him off, but I was stuck there, unable to breathe. The yogi's breath was hot and heavy, the room was burning. Jow, Alina. Baba Ram murmured. You must do penance for your sin. Even Rahul G said that, didn't he? I had. I fucking had. My eyes were beginning to blur as the man began to whisper sexual, disgusting things into my ear, but in a tone one would whisper to a child. His Hindi was clean and perfect but to me it was the ugly, broken Hindi of Mr. Thornton. Ram's comments about my crotch, his murmurings about how much sexual pleasure he'd had with Alina, Zach, Tinu, every child, all blurred into Pat Howe. Read. And in front of me, Alina walked into the fire. She did not scream, and I watched her burn. I don't remember it, my selfish, depraved, nauseating mind only focused on touch and sense, breath didn't shoot into my chest, I was suffocating although nobody was choking me. I don't remember how that beautiful little girl did not walk through the fire but stood in it. Stood like a statue, looking at her tormentor, burning herself and what was inside her alive. The room smelled like the ugly backroad bazaars, I choked on vomit, and begged Dash. 
please dash. A thud, the charred body of Alina fell backwards, and in a surge of sudden adrenaline, I pushed the yogi forward. He did not die peacefully. I burned him alive. I held him down as he struggled, I still couldn't breath as my hands blistered and popped, reddened and cracked. The police found me like that, holding his head down into the flames. Today. We all have our Agnipot, our path of fire. Mine happened to be my entire life. So were those of those poor children, hefted outside by Smita and the cook. So was that of Alina, a body burned black by its own will. Smita took her path of fire the moment I was arrested. She pulled every political string she had, she begged, she sold everything she saved for her dowry to lessen my sentence. My sentence? Well, if you find a man burning the head of a yogic saint, a pregnant child in the room, everything goes out of the window. But I deserve it. Not for killing them, perhaps, but for all of it. For my inability to care for anyone but myself, for my foolhardiness in telling Alina that wrongdoers would be punished, for my weak body for betraying me every, single, time I was touched. The testament of the mutilated kids did not count, apparently, because who cares for the word of the victim? Smita had no proof, as she was confirmed helping the children out of the building. In this shit world, all that saved me was corruption and greed, Smita's begging and bribing, that lessened my sentence to five years, for involuntary manslaughter as a result of perceived self-defense. So here I sit, in jail. It's visiting time, and Smita sits opposite me, listening to the entire story, from Thornton to Ram, from empty classrooms to empty walls. Putney, he'd said, a laugh, a note of hysteria creeping in. Told me to read. Funny, isn't it? Don't follow him then. Smita replied, pointing to the sheets of paper beside me. Leakney. Right. So I did.